Hello and a very warm welcome to the Total Saints podcast. We are the weekly Saints podcast, your home for all things Southampton Football Club. This podcast is being live streamed on Facebook, X, uh, X or Twitter or whatever we're calling it now. I think we're going to go with X tonight. Twitch and also on our YouTube channel too. And our podcast is entirely supported by our loyal Patreon community. Without you, we couldn't make the show each week. And this week, it's a huge welcome to Jono, who has joined our Bobby Stokes tier. Now, Johnny lives, uh, Jono lives in Australia and he's at Aussie St. John if you want to give him a follow. If you do fancy joining Jono and becoming a patron, I've got all the details on the way very soon. Uh, coming up this week on the podcast, the football is back and it was a trip to Huddersfield, but it felt like Rotherham 2.0. Uh, Saints dominated the game only to drop two points. We'll try and pinpoint what went wrong. Uh, never fear, there are two home games up next. First, a visit of Bristol City on Wednesday. Going to preview that one later with Ben Mead from the Robins on Tour YouTube channel. And we finished the week with Cardiff City at St Mary's on Saturday. So we're going to look ahead to that one. My name is Martin Stark and I'm joined by our regular contributors. Steve Grant is the owner of Saints Web. Alfie House is the senior Southampton reporter for the Daily Echo. And Glenda LaCour is the writer of the blog League One Minus Ten all underpinned by our TSP patrons. This is episode 253 of the Total Saints podcast. Now, before we get into the football, the regular plug for our Patreon community, whose monthly contributions support the show. We've got four tiers ranging from £5 to £20 per month. And aside from supporting the podcast, each of those tiers has perks like access to an ad-free version of the pod. There's exclusive TSP t-shirts and merch bundles, the TSP FPL, and access to our TSP events and much, much more as well. Now, if you want to get involved in supporting TSP each month, head over to patreon.com forward slash Total Saints podcast for more details. All the links are in the podcast show notes and the YouTube description. So let's go. And we're going to start with this. After dominating the first half, Saints conceded a late goal to drop two points at Huddersfield. I mean, a thoroughly depressing afternoon, let's be honest. Uh, Alfie, going to start with you this week. I know you've written about this today. They have a, a bit of a problem at 1-0. Um, why are we so scared to push for that that second goal? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if the answer was obvious, they would have solved it. Um, yeah, Russell was was really angry about it. I think you could see that um, where the way he was talking about it. I think if you do, they took the lead in 13 out of 17 games this season, which is actually quite impressive to score first in that many games. Um, I think they've won nine of those and drawn a couple more. Um, and I felt the first half yesterday was fine. You know, I thought it was probably good at best. I thought they had complete domination of the ball. There was a couple of hardest field counters, um, which Steve actually mentioned to us in the group chat as well. Um, and but that, I didn't feel they were dangerous. You know, they lacked real quality up front. Huddersfield. And I thought Jan Bednarek did quite well on a couple of occasions to sort of marshal that. And there wasn't loads of chances, but the, what they did do, Saints, they turned the atmosphere. Um, you know, there is another team out there. You're not entitled to score sort of four or five goals a game. They defended really well, I thought. But you know, they turned the atmosphere. They 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 turned the screw a little bit, and they got the deserved goal at the end of the first half. Um, you know, obviously Stewie creative again with that one, and, and Armo was tenth for the season, which I think only Sammy Smodix has more. Uh, but the second half was totally different, wasn't it? You know, Huddersfield were unlucky not to score three or four. <clears throat> Excuse me, Russell Martin's assessment was there was not enough energy, not enough intensity. I agree with that, but I think as well as the drop in energy, the quality just dropped completely as well. Um, yeah, I think they were about 20% less success rate on both their four passes and final third entries. So they were forcing the ball and they didn't need to. Uh, they were panicking and I think it's a real mentality issue. It's something that has to be sorted. You know, I think with Russell, you can often sort of work out who he thinks is at fault. He'll never say, he'll never blame the players. But I felt it was pretty clear that he felt that they didn't take on anything he said at half time yesterday. Um, and he was pretty angry with that. So, yeah, it's not the end of the world. There's still nine games unbeaten. Um, it's two points dropped. I think they missed Charlie Alcaraz for sure. Um, he obviously picked up a knock with Argentina, uh, but he implied that he'll be back fresh. So, look, two home games to put it right. And Glenn Alfie says that, I mean, we're unbeaten in nine matches. We're still fourth. So, mm. I mean, a point away isn't an absolute disaster, but that's kind of not how it felt at the final whistle yesterday. Uh, I was fuming. Um, I think if there'd been another 10 minutes, we'd have lost, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, the, the the second half was dreadful. Uh, the word I keep coming back to is complacency. I just think we, we seem to think that... Um, the job was done, and all we and Huddersfield didn't have anything, and all we needed to do was rock up for the second half and uh, knock the ball about. But it's it's funny people have mentioned the Rotherham game, and that there are similarities to that. Um, I was more in mind with the Preston away game when we started the second half appallingly, um, and we did the same thing yesterday. We gave the ball away on the halfway line. I can't remember who it was, but it was it was a 
terrible pass forward. And from that, Huddersfield sort of got a couple of corners, had a couple of sort of like incidents near our goal, shall we say. And that seemed to give them the confidence. We seemed to say, you know, Huddersfield weren't didn't look like doing anything on their own. And we just handed them the initiative. And then it seemed to me that they suddenly thought, oh, hang on, this lot aren't as good as we um, as we thought they were in the first half. And we just gave them encouragement. And uh, yeah, the, the, the second half was was pathetic. I think the Rotherham game, it, it you know, it was a one shot bolt from the blue type of thing. Whereas whereas this one, Huddersfield were by far the better side in the second half and totally deserved to um to to get the goal at the end. I didn't I didn't think they had the quality to actually get the ball in the net. Uh, nothing nothing I'd seen suggested that they had. But, and eventually it's a bit of a lucky goal because he's he's crossed it and everyone's missed it. But it's um it, you can't complain about Huddersfield getting a point. They did, they totally deserve to get it, and um, we didn't deserve all three. You can't turn up and only play for half the game. And and actually, the first sort of half an hour, though we had control of the football, we really didn't do anything. Uh, there was a little spell just before we scored where Stu Armstrong hit the post. Smallbone had a shot from the edge of the box, which he needs to do more often, by the way. Um, and then and then we scored, and that we had just had this little spell. And and the goal came at the end of that, but I didn't think the first half now was particularly, you know, it was a bit it was a bit too much propaganda. Obviously, you you know you want to draw the sting from the crowd and that sort of thing, but uh, but yeah, I didn't think the first half was particularly brilliant, apart from the the ten minutes before half time and the second half was garbage. So to be honest, I was quite happy to get away with the point, but it's always dis you know it's always disappointing when you let one in in the whatever it was eighty seventh minute or something. We were struggling to find a Huddersfield fan before the game. We thought they might actually get anything from it at all, Steve. I think they had one win in nine games. They were booed off at half time, but obviously significantly improved in the second half. So, I mean, you were there. What what changed for you? What what was it? The atmosphere? Was it just a shift? Um, no, I don't think anything really changed. I mean, it was it was weird. I don't think they were booed off for the performance. They were booed off because the substitution they made in the that they were forced into in the first half. Basically, centre forward got injured, um, and they brought on a, another centre half and rejigged the rejigged the system a little bit. Playing with about five, were they? Yeah, and um, basically the home fans didn't like that. But problem is, you look down their bench; they didn't have any attacking players on the bench. I don't think um, they, only, they were only able to name seven of the nine subs. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess the question question from from Darren Moore to the to the fan base is, I mean, what are you expecting me to do with this with um with this set of players that's available to me? Um, so yeah, boo, booed off at, at half time, but yeah, I, I think it was a it was a boo to the manager rather than the players because I mean, I thought Huddersfield were, were kind of all right. It was there not an awful lot going on in the game, as Glenn said. I mean, we didn't have a shot till the thirty fifth minute. I don't think that I can nothing that I can re- remember anyway. Um, and we left ourselves wide open through the centre and midfield on three or four occasions where, I mean, if we'd been playing against a team that either had a little bit of confidence or a little bit of quality, um, we'd been absolutely murdered on the break in that first half. Um, but we got away with it because, frankly, Huddersfield are uh, lacking, A, lacking in confidence, B, lacking in quality. So, um, yeah, and, and I think that's basically what bred the complacency that we saw in the in the second half. They thought they could coast through. Um, they thought that no matter what Huddersfield create, they're not going to score score with any of it anyway. Um, and actually, up until they scored with a with a cross that obviously he's not meant he's not intended to score from there. Um, actually, the, our our complacency was actually being proven right. Um, that for all that we gave them two or three really good chances. I mean, the the two headers that they missed were, I mean, just get them on target, lads. And it, it, they weren't difficult um, opportunities, I didn't think. I mean, certainly if if that had fallen to what, those two chances had fallen to one of our players, then you'd be expecting them to um, uh, to be scoring. So yeah, I mean, they they got got the equaliser quite late. But, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't as if it hadn't been coming. Um, so, yeah, dis- disappointing from, the, from that perspective. But also, I mean, slightly annoying that from, from that point onwards, for, for that plus the seven minutes of injury time, all of a sudden we showed a little bit of urgency. It's like, well, I mean, where was this in the yeah. 86 minutes previous um, for the most part? It, 
it was just just really lackadaisical. Um, and you'd have thought, I mean, given how bloody cold it was, it was absolutely freezing, um, that the players might have wanted to kind of move around a little bit more, um, keep keep um, keep themselves warm by basically dragging Huddersfield all over the place. And we didn't do it. We just made it really easy for them. Um, so, yeah, very, very disappointing. Um, and, yeah, they're going to have to, I think, probably before the start of this week, again, you, you'd always be reasonably satisfied with seven points from nine. Um, but now having dropped two in, in what was on paper the easiest game, you're now looking to, looking to try and win um, both, of the tough, both the tough ones at home coming up. But it, it kind of feels like we've been here before, Alfie, haven't we? You know, we've lost the one that we should win on paper and then we've managed to pull it out of the bag. So when he says that the mentality has cost us two points, who do you think is to blame for that? Is that the players or is that the manager? Is that a, a communication thing? Do they just kind of need to sit down and, and do a proper proper debrief and, 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 and try and get it out of their system? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, really. I think it's probably just a collective responsibility. At the end of the day, the manager is responsible for, for the mentality and for that kind of thing, of course. Um, but... Like I say, we have been here. We have been here before. Um, I would say that the players probably have the burden or take the burden of responsibility for this one, in my opinion, because I just think they weren't good enough, quite simply. Um, I think that they played it too slow. And Although, actually, if you look at the statistics, they didn't just pass backwards and sideways in the second half. What they did do was just um, you know, lose the ball far too often. They yeah. drew pressure onto themselves. Um, so it was poor from that regard. And look, obviously, it's difficult for Russell as well, being in the, in, the, um, in the stands for the first time for three bookings, two of which he feels were... Um, ridiculous and he hated that experience so he's got to try and avoid um, getting five more yellows and getting a two match ban um, anytime this season because he really didn't enjoy that um, so yeah I don't know exactly who takes responsibility for that but it's something they've got to fix because like I say we've been here before um, we've seen it with if Rotherham well, I agree with Glenn actually I think Rotherham was slightly different because mm. they, ha they hammered Rotherham it was a freak anomaly this one I agree was a little bit more like Preston where they just came out slow sluggish um, and Will Smallburn said it himself as well that's the thing that I think fans will find frustrating the, the players sort of they're aware that they're doing it um, but they just haven't found a way to stop it. But like I said, I'm not all doom and gloom because I think that any point away from home in the championship isn't a terrible point. It's just the manner in which it came. We're not going to need another fans forum with some PowerPoints mm. anytime soon then. That's that's kind of what we're <laughs> saying. A um, couple of subs yesterday, Glenn. I mean, Sunamana was was taken off on 54 minutes. It, it's always difficult with the, the international breaks and, and players coming back and, and not spending a week um, together. He replaced with... Sam Adozi yesterday, but it certainly sounded like yeah. Russell Martin wasn't happy with, with Sulemana and, and the communication that he'd had with him at half time. Sulemana's a strange player. He's he looked very dangerous in the first half on occasions when he got to to run at the fullback one on one. Um and then he came out the second half and looked like he couldn't be bothered. And so I'm not I'm not surprised I wasn't surprised when he um he got hauled off. He doesn't seem to be able to do it for ninety minutes um as yet. And I mean, personally, I think there are still slight question marks over his um, over his attitude sometimes. So, uh, so I, I don't think he was um, he didn't certainly didn't cover himself in glory in the second half. Um, I, I'm not sh sure Russell Martin really realised that the the game was slipping a bit. We lost control in midfield. Um, I thought an obvious change could have been Shay Charles for Will Smallbone a long time before it happened. Because once the opposition gets about us in midfield and, and they, they start getting a foot in and they start having a bit of possession, Will Smallbone can be a bit of a, a passenger. The, the ball seems to just get passed around him or he gets hustled off the ball. Stuart Armstrong started to get hustled off the ball as well. So I think that was that was kind of where we, we lost control and we could have done with maybe a change in midfield a little bit earlier than um, than we actually got. But, uh, but yeah, it was good. I mean, it's good to see Ross Stewart again, but... Unfortunately, we didn't have possession of the ball to sort of like get him on it in dangerous areas and we weren't getting crosses into the box at that stage. Um, and the other interesting thing I found from yesterday is that um, Ryan Fraser um, didn't really affect the game at all. Barely, barely saw him. So he, um, he gave a good, um, a good advert for why he's been an impact substitute recently. And uh, I think he will be back in that role uh, come Wednesday night. But uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think anyone particularly covered themselves in glory yesterday, but I, I agree with what Alfie said. I think most of it is um, is on the players. Um, maybe maybe a lack of, you know, maybe the captain has to look at himself a little bit as well and, and say, you know, should a captain be getting hold of the team at, at some point and, mm -hmm. you know, balling a few people out to say, 
we, the, you know, this isn't good enough. It's all very well saying it after the game. You need to be doing it during the game. Maybe Russell Martin being in the stands made made a bit of a difference there. Maybe, but then you know he's communicating all the time with the bench. So uh, and he was only about yeah, five so... yards behind the bench. It wasn't as if he was. Yeah, if yeah. he wanted to shout, he could. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. two beat yeah. his hands and a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so you know, so so over, yeah, I've, I've blamed. I've just about thrown everybody under the bus there. I'll keep going. So um, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think anyone particularly covered themselves in glory um, yesterday. Management players, starters, substitutes, whatever. Is it worse, Steve? Because Ipswich and Leeds dropped some points. It just feels a bit like a, a missed opportunity, especially with with Leeds playing on Friday night and, and then getting a draw, wasn't it? So we had the opportunity to go third. I think that's what was really sort of niggling at me come five o'clock yesterday. Yeah, that was annoying. Um, yeah, when you've seen that, obviously Leeds dropped points on Friday, and we knew that Ipswich was going to have a tough game in the evening at, at West Brom. You thought this was a great opportunity to get ourselves into third, close the gap, really put proper pressure on on Ipswich before kickoff. Um, I mean, obviously they end up going losing the end, losing anyway. Um, but having yeah, having been, been handed that advantage by Leeds, and also with Leicester and Ipswich dropping points before the international break, you kind of felt that this game is a really good opportunity to um, kind of carry on the the momentum that we've been building up in the weeks before, um, before the players went away. And yeah, to, to kind of come back in and put such an anemic performance in is, is yeah, frustrating. And problem is that anything that's identifiable, they're not really going to be able to work on it that much this week um, because of the, uh, because we've got the midweek game, you're not going to be training every day. Um, so specifics are going to be very difficult to work on. It's going to be more fitness recovery, um, that sort of thing. Anything specific they might have they might have worked on um, last week at some point. I don't think they're going to have a whole lot of time this week, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get on to Bristol City very soon. I just want to go around and see if there's anybody that we can put into the poll for Player of the Week. I think it's going to be slim pickings. Alfie, I'll give you first dibs. Who was the who oh, was the brilliant. best of a Thank bad you. bunch? <laughs> yeah, so many to choose from. I mean, you can I go honestly... for the goal score if you like, and then uh... <laughs> yeah, my mind is completely blank. I actually can't think of anybody um, that I, I think all your ratings. Nominate. Everyone was got like a six, wasn't it? It, it was yeah. like blanket sixes across the board. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't ever want to put one forward. On this occasion, this this might be the only week we can't. Um, we can, anybody that was on the bench, um, Steve, it, did you see anything that we might have missed yesterday? Anybody that uh, that is worthy of a couple of votes? Um, I thought Stu Armstrong was decent when he got on yeah. the ball. Um, he was looking to take people on quite a lot, even in sort of fairly confined spaces, which I think you need against teams that are sitting that are going to sit deep against mm -hmm. us. Um, other than that, James Bree was solid. Um, and it was noticeable that they started to um, they wanted to attack us more down that side um, after we made the substitution. Uh, I mean, in fairness, Ryan Manning was fine. He didn't didn't make any mistakes. He was and he was um, a lot more of an outlet in in the attacking sense. Mm. But they certainly um, Huddersfield certainly felt that they could um, they could run at us a little bit more that side. Obviously, the goal came from there, but that was it wasn't it wasn't Manning not closing um, closing the cross down. I think Adozi was the closest to yeah. uh, closest to him. Um, but yeah, it's yeah slim pickings really. Stewie is the obvious shout. I think mm. yeah, probably just give yeah. him the award. Maybe now. for the goal he scored for Scotland as well. Um, <laughs> that was uh, anybody else, Glenn? Any standouts for you? No, I was going to say the two that, that Steve said, but Stuart Armstrong, because he's the one that, when I mean, he set up the goal, he had the sort of like best effort before that when he hit the post. He He's the one that tries to make things happen. We, we you know, we, we're good at keeping the ball. We know that, but you need the player to, um, you know, to op open the door for, uh, you know, for us, for us to score goals. And Stuart Armstrong, I thought, um, didn't, was, was one of the few who um, didn't really deserve that result yesterday um i thought he uh, i thought he did reasonably well though he did tire in the second half or he, you know after an international break as well you know yeah. sometimes you find yeah. yourself on the bench doesn't he so yeah uh, well thankfully there aren't right. any more of those until march now are there? so yeah. <laughs> um yeah the uh, the games come thick and fast anyway um the midweek football is back this week on wednesday we welcome bristol city to st mary's and i'm pleased to say that ben mead from the robins on tour youtube channel is here to help us preview that one hi ben thanks for coming on you're right 
Yes, not too bad. No problem. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I'm good. looking forward to Wednesday. Good. Well, yeah, I think we are as well. I mean, you had a decent result at the weekend by the looks of it. You must have been happy with that win. Yeah, definitely. I think it was a much needed one as well. Obviously, Liam Manning coming in, I think after, just after two days, we, we had QPR away and obviously with two days to work, he can't do much there. So this was his first real proper game um, at home as well. I think with the week we've got as well, so it's a tough run of games. Um, coming into this winter period. So I think it was a much needed win. And um, I'm a bit more confident heading into Wednesday now than if, you know, we were still looking for that first win under Manning. Do you think that the the change had to be made? Let's just deal with that first. Um, obviously, Manning coming in, but um, did, did he have to go? It's it's still a question that City fans are still asking each other, really. And um, I don't think Pearson had to leave. Um, but now we've got Manning in and... It's sort of a refresh that I think we sort of did need. I think although Pearson did a brilliant job with us, both on and off the pitch, I think he wasn't going to take us any further. I don't think we would have managed to reach playoffs anytime soon under Pearson. And I think he probably would have gone at the end of the season when his contract was up anyway. Um, I still think maybe it was a bit harsh to to get rid of him when we did. Um, I think the sort of board were looking for a reason to sack him and then obviously losing mm. on the derby away at Cardiff is sort of, you know, the only reason they were going to get really. So it's a weird one. I think it was harsh to sack him, but then I think it, it was it was going to happen sooner rather than later anyway. You were shaking your head and uh, nodding along, Alfie. Did you think it was a strange one to get rid of Pearson then? No, Ben's like pointed out exactly why. Um he went. I think he probably. I'm. I read him between the lines. I feel that maybe health reasons and things like that were probably yeah. a factor as well because he you know wasn't always able to be there. Um, a lot of things like that going on. Um, but I just think the job that Nice did with City over the, the last few years, given that they, the investment they've had or the lack thereof, you know, selling their best players each summer and then spending none of it, you know, twenty million or whatever it was for Alex Scott and reinvesting zilch. I don't know what more they expected of him. And, and Ben pointed out, I felt that they got rid of Nige because they've been waiting to rather than because of a, a poor run of results. I mean, the, the statement they gave was that um, he wasn't fulfilling the club's ambitions of, of being in the top six, but the budget is nowhere near the top six. So I don't know where they got yeah. that uh, impression from. I think um, the, the health reasons are, are definitely valid because hmm. I was speaking to one of City's uh, reporters yesterday and I think it was one of those ones where when with Pearson, it was a manager that would sort of sit back and... Uh, sort of tell the players what to do from, from further back but then obviously with his health issues um, he wasn't on the bench for the majority of the games mm. leading up to his uh, getting rid of him so yeah I think he health reasons did have a part to play as well um, We've all been there when you fired a manager and then you, you're thinking right here we go we're going to get someone really decent coming in and then they go and, and get the guy from Oxford no disrespect to, to Liam Manning uh, I'm sure a great guy but was he top of your list Ben was that someone that you, you'd heard of and thought you know he's he's the man for the job It was such a weird one because obviously you know when, when a manager goes there there's a lot of rumours about you know who's getting interviewed and all that and I think the biggest name we had rumoured was Frank Lampard um and obviously with those rumors i i was actually quite, quite happy with that as a as a young manager but then obviously there was i think Notts county's manager was rumored as well and obviously also liam manning uh and a few i think there's a few foreign managers as well and it was a bit it was a bit up in the air really and i think liam manning said in his first interview that he only really got contacted the day before he actually came down to bristol to sign the contract so it it's a weird one but i think it's the sort of manager we wanted. You know, you see the other clubs like Leicester. Leicester, they've got a, a young manager and that isn't really well known, but, you know, he's he's a coach rather than a manager. And I think that's what, what City were really looking for. And I think that's what we've got. So three points off top six, I think, in the moment, isn't it? That's that's the aim for the season. Is Have, have you got the squad to do that, do you think? Again, I think every club around, you know, around the mid table upwards is, you know, pushing on the top six. And, it's going to be this sort of winter period where we're going to find out if we're actually going to make make you know a real push for the top six. Um, squad wise, yes, I think we we do, but then it is just you know the likes of Mometi who we bought in under Pierce and now even just uh, a two games in is looking a completely different player under Manning than he was with Pearson. Um, uh, Jason Knight as well coming in in the summer, looking very good. It's again, you know, the winter period is so busy and tough, you know, 
one or two injuries and you know we could be in a bit of bother again but yeah so where's one i'm not too sure i think top 10 is probably the aim now with obviously all the changes that are going on uh but you know if we can come out of sort of you know january in the top 10 few points off top six then yeah no reason why we shouldn't be pushing that You've got some quite key fixtures coming up, haven't you? I mean, there was the QPR yes. one before the, the international break, uh, and that was uh, a point. You got the win at the weekend, and now it's going to be quite testing. Yeah, but I mean, I think already this season we've had a few games where we've dropped points where we didn't need to drop points, and if it does come down to you know, the end of May and we're only a few points off the playoffs, we're going to be kicking ourselves. Like Stoke at home, I think we were 2-0 up and we lost that 3-2. QPR as well, you know, going, going to QPR. You know, you're you're hoping for three points, really, aren't you? So to come away with a point, it's not the end of the world, but still, uh, there was another one as well. But so yeah, there's that's two or three games where you know we've dropped points where we didn't really need to. So yeah, it's it's vital the next few, but obviously it's tough. Like going to you guys on Wednesday, I don't think many City fans are expecting anything but a loss, maybe a draw if we're lucky. But I, I know I think you'd have to be very optimistic to be hoping to come away with three points, and then. You know, there's two or three that are winnable, to be fair. I think we've got Norwich, Huddersfield, Blackburn, um, Sunderland and Hull heading up to Christmas. There's five winnable games, to be honest. But again, you know, the championship's so unpredictable, you never know. I, mean, I think the way I'm... that Liam Manning wants his City side to play this season might will be, um, I think it might be beneficial for Saints on Wednesday because I think certainly when they drew nil nil with QPR last week or a couple of weeks ago, there was a lot of panic about um, what this possession based style. So they want to play a very yeah. similar way, like Ben mentioned, um, like a, a young modern coach who is on the ground on the training ground doing. And I think that is what suits about them right now. When they come up against teams like Rotherham or like you know Preston or um, whoever else had us for this weekend, who've got a low block and they're putting ten men behind the ball and they're defending sternly that's when they come and start i think if city come and st mary's and they play the way they want to play it could quite easily be two three goals for saying so i think they'll 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 win that battle if it's a, a direct competition they'll win that how do you see us approach or um bristol approaching this one on, on wednesday ben do you think they're gonna you know is how you called it right there is that the kind of setup is that is that how you see that playing out well yeah i mean what it's man in third game and i don't think he's going to be hmm. planning on changing anything this early, you know, with the teams we're playing. And I, we, we saw on Saturday the first sort of 35 minutes, it was pretty boring. But then it was when you look back at it a day after and it was, you know, possession. We we, we kept the ball. We didn't we didn't really give Borough any chances. And I mean, I think if that is going to how we're going to play on um, Wednesday, then it's not going to be the end of the world. So, yeah, I think it will be sort of, you know, possession football and then... Um, you know, just trying to, to find that final pass in the final third to then just get a shot on goal. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I don't think Manning will be planning on changing much, much from Saturday, even though it is, you know, I've been one of the best teams in the league where maybe under Pierce we would have changed it and, you know, got gone there quite defensively. But I, I'm I'm hoping that we're gonna gonna play the same on Saturday and hopefully we'll manage to stop you stop your attack and maybe find a few goals. I can see a few changes for us. I know we kind of touched on it earlier, Glenn, but you, do you think like Alcaraz comes back into the team and, and maybe Ross Stewart plays a bigger role on, on Wednesday, especially with the, the two games this week? Um, yeah, I definitely see um, see Alcaraz coming back into the team, but it's it's hard to know which... I mean, when we've had three game weeks before, there's been an obvious game to prioritise when you mm. could rotate players. Um mm. Uh, was it Stoke where we where we did it? Um, and yeah, it, we all look, we looked very Carabao Cup, didn't we, with our um, with our lineup? But uh, but uh, you know, we got Bristol City at home, then we got Cardiff at home, so it's two teams in sort of similar positions in the league. Um, so so I don't know. Um, apart from Charlie Alcaraz, there's no one screaming at me saying Camel Dean's the other one, right? Will it, will, it, will Camel Dean be dropped? That's the question, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and if if Camel Dean's dropped, who who does he bring in? Does he just bring Alcaraz in as a as a as a straight swap? Or um, don't, I don't think Fraser does, can start again. No, surely. I think Alcaraz coming for Fraser, and then the Camel Dean one will be a separate question potentially. I mean, we're guessing obviously. Yeah. But and if he mm. if he's out, it's either Adozi or Shay Adams, I guess. Mm. With um, you know, with with things being switched around, and he's already said Ross Stewart isn't ready to start, yeah. and I I I totally understand that. So I can see us changing a few, but fundamentally I see the uh, the same back four. I guess in a home game, uh, he may want to pick Ryan Manning. 
to get you know to get more crosses in from that left hand side because though James Bree is is more solid defensively and he's he's played well defensively, he's not going to get up the wing and get across in with his left foot. So so may maybe in home games that they're looking to put the opposition under a bit more pressure, maybe Ryan Manning will come back in. But uh, but other than that, I don't really see any changes. Certainly um, not in the centre backs or um, or or midfield. Um, I think. Um, you know, I think Russell Martin has, has, has established the sort of eight or nine core players who are always going to play unless they're um, unless they're carrying injuries. So I, I think I think will be I think will be pretty similar to uh, to what we had against Huddersfield. Um, hopefully, we'll turn up and play for ninety minutes this time instead of uh, mm. instead of just forty five. But uh, I, I see this as as, uh, as as quite a difficult game. I mean, the, you know, the three two win that Bristol City had against Middlesbrough. That's I mean, Middlesbrough are one of the are one of the better sides, and to mm. you know to get pegged peg back to two two and still come out and win that kind of shows that the the players are playing for the new manager. So, um, I mean, I had Bristol City sort of pegged as certainties for mid table at, at the start of the season. Yeah, <laughs> seeing seeing the seeing the squad they got, I just thought mid table. So, uh, so I'm not I'm not sure about the um, getting rid of uh, Nigel Pearson because he's in the because uh, he wasn't in the top six. I don't. Yeah, that, that one don't quite ring. You don't buy it, from yeah? No, not really. Um, I've got a lot of time for Nigel Pearson from his little yeah, his time he had at, mm-hmm. at Saints um, because he he came in during the the, the sort of Michael Wild, Leon Crouch, Rupert Lowe shambles and actually kept kept us up one season. And did our was it, it post Jan Portfleet? Was it then? Was that that? No, that, he was, you know, he was, was before, a bit after that. He was he was before him. Oh lord! Uh, yeah, so, so Pe- he Pearson, a, yeah, Pearson's contract wasn't wasn't extended he was only given short term until the end of the season yeah. um yeah, Ru- rupert low came back didn't yeah. He? yeah um and low decided yeah i mean I th- from what i from what i remember i think there were stories that pearson wanted a pretty hefty salary that we just that we just weren't that rupert low un- unsurprisingly yeah. wasn't willing to give him um and i mean to be honest i i kind of find the sort of opinions on Pearson from our side of things a bit a bit baffling given that he got he came in took over from Jason Dodd and John Gorman oh, yeah. um in <laughs> late in late February after Bristol Rovers had dumped us out of the FA Cup um and yeah I think 14 games in charge and he won four of them and took us from 14th yeah. to needing a goal 15 minutes from the end of the season to stay up. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure he actually was that good a manager for us. Um, but he's he's one of those sort of straight talking guys who mm. who fans like to listen to in press conferences, yeah. which I mean, it's utterly meaningless. Mm, mm. Um, but yeah, results were crap, and and yet he's he's still favoured over some of our managers that were actually good. Was it the Stern John? It was yes. the Stern John goal, wasn't it against but Sheffield kept it United? Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Stern, Stern John kept us up. Basically, he scored twenty three goals for the team that finished um, fourth, fourth bottom. Ben's eyes have glazed over. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I bet, I bet Ben doesn't even remember Stern John. <laughs> uh, this is the bit, Ben, where we do score predictions. So I will come to you last, um, Steve. I'm going to start with you. Uh, score prediction for Wednesday night, please. <clears throat> Ooh, uh, open game, I think. Um, mm. Yeah, if Bristol City are going to play the way that um, that Liam Manning seemingly want, wants them to play, then yeah, uh, anything goes. Um, yeah, two all. Two all, right. Okay, Glenn? Um, uh, I, I back us to get back on the uh, back on the horse a little bit um, on, on Wednesday night. So I'll go for a, a 2-1 home win. There's the 2-1, the famous 2-1. Alfie? Yeah, I think my 4-0 uh, at Huddersfield wasn't brilliant in the end, so I'm going to rein it in a little bit. It could um, have been. <laughs> yeah, I, I will copy Glenn on this occasion. I know that Glenn copies Steve sometimes, so I'll say 2-1. You've got to play the numbers. Play the numbers game. Uh, and Ben, a score prediction for you, please. How do you see this one playing out on Wednesday? Well, I'm not I'm not extremely confident, but I'm going to back us to, to come away with a point. I'll go 2-2. Two, and two. I, I, I take a point now. You would take a point ahead of the game. Do you think a lot? Do you think that's going to be a lot of fans? Do you think they'd agree with you? They take yeah. a point going into this one. Yeah, one hundred percent. You're going you keep to keep the beaten run going. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. You're, you're arguably going to one of the maybe the top five teams in the league. You know, with maybe still you know players that should be playing in the Premier League. You, I think you'd be you'd be silly not to take a point, especially you know our new manager's third game. And not too far this one either, so it should be a good atmosphere. No. Good, good, good turnout on Wednesday. Do you think? 
Yeah, well, sold out away end. Um, so it should be, should be a good one. Yeah, looking forward to it. Nice one. All right, well, thank you very much for coming on. Um, enjoy Wednesday, and uh, we'll catch up with you later on in the season, Ben. Cheers. Definitely, yeah. I'll, I'll hopefully enjoy it as long as we don't get, don't get pummeled. <laughs> Cheers, Ben. Now, we head into December with Cardiff City, the visitors on Saturday. At the weekend, Cardiff scored two goals in stoppage time to snatch a late win at Preston North End. They scored in the 96th and the 99th minute, which for a while was our trick. Um, Glenn, this is going to be a, a stern test to, to end the week, regardless of what happens on Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, we said this before. It's always strange talking about a game that's two games away because um, uh, they've obviously... I think they're. I think they've got West Brom at home midweek, which will hopefully be a, bit, a really, really tough game for them. Um, unlike Bristol City, who I had pegged as being mid-table, I had Cardiff as pegged as being bottom six mm. because they just didn't seem to have anything about them. Did they sign Aaron Ramsey? They did, yes. didn't they? Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I don't know how much he's played because he's a bit of a sick note these days. But uh, um, these these days. <laughs> yeah, these days, every day. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, Cardiff have done a lot better than um, than I than I thought they would. Um, yeah, and I mean that's a great win against Preston. Um, again, shows they're uh, playing for the manager, who's uh, I had I've never heard of this guy, Errol Bullet, who is apparently Turkish, um, has managed a few sort of Turkish League One clubs, um, which is their top division, and Super League, whatever it's called. Um, including Fenerbahce, but he's never lasted mm. very long at, at, at any of those clubs, sort of like 18 months. So you you wonder, though results seem to be half decent. So you do wonder if it's a personality thing, why he never seemed to last. So, uh, but he's done, he's obviously done very well at Cardiff and they, you know, they're, a, I, I wouldn't call them genuine playoff contenders, but they've, they've done well enough to be in the top half of the league all season. So, so yeah, it will be, it will be a tough game. Apparently they lack a goal scorer. Um, so you can guarantee that we'll throw one in in that game. Um, but, <laughs> got it. but yeah, it will, it will be it will be a tough game, and uh, how we go into that a lot will obviously depend on uh, on how we how we get on against Bristol City. I've got your Aaron Ramsey stats here, Glenn. He uh, he scored three in his first six games, uh, but that was in September. He hasn't played since because of any injury. So right. there you go. yeah, there you go. But he was in, he was in the Wales squad last week. Well, maybe he's back then. This could be it. It could be back on Saturday. Oh, marvellous. That's just what we need. Um, I mean, Alfie, we, we, to be fair, we have stood up to these tests in recent weeks, haven't we? I mean, there was a time we would be dreading this game on Saturday, but we've the, these home games, that we, we've it felt like we've turned a corner regardless of, of what may or may not happen on Wednesday night. Yeah, I don't go into the game you know, terrified um, like we would have done last season, I think. But I, I agree with Glenn. I, I thought that Cardiff was certain to go down this season. Um, you know, That's just obviously my, my Bristol side coming out as well because I actually hate Cardiff. <laughs> but I, I don't really rate their squad. Um, but like I say, yeah, Bullet's doing a, a decent job, so it's not going to be an easy game by any means. But I think you have to back yourself. And if you want to be a team that's going to be going up in the top two, and I think Ipswich have... You know, they've not won three of the last four games, so there's every chance that Ipswich are not going to be in the top two in six, seven weeks' time. If you want to be that team that's up there, you have to win these games. Don't you? you have to win at home to the likes yeah. of Bristol City. You have to win at home to the likes of Cardiff. So regardless of the form they're on, and they're in good form, I think they've won a game quite heavily, wasn't it? 4-0 the other day. Um, so that they're a good, good side, but you have to back yourself. They did the double over us four years ago, I think, Steve. I was going back through some of the results. Jan Bednarek and Jack Stevens were the centre-backs that day. So um, can you remember who scored? Uh, I think... that. Jack Stevens might have even scored, I think, in the game that we played. So, um, oh Christ, yeah, we lo- yeah we lost two one, two one, and he scored the consolation, I think. Yeah, so yeah, um, quite possibly. And the the I mean, game obviously. at their the game at their place was uh, Ralph Hasnell's first game. Um, yeah. where oh, of course it was. Yeah, Char- mm. Charlie Austin started up front and showed exactly why he wasn't ever going to play again for Ralph Hasnell. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think Jan, Jan Vestergaard played an under hit back pass, proper proper eighty style under hit back pass to the keeper that. Um, their left back turned centre back turned centre forward. Um, who basically played every position for them. I think um, ran through and ran through and scored the late winner. So, how do you think Saturday's going to work out? I mean, it's obviously going to be slightly different to uh, to that being uh, a few years ago. Huh. But what have you made of Cardiff? Yeah, they. I mean, I must admit, I've not I've not seen a huge amount of them other than obviously seeing their results and and the goals every week. But mm. from a um, and you look at, look at where they are in the league, and yeah, I mean they're they're punching 
I mean, as Alfie and Glenn have said, punching way above where pretty much everybody would have expected them. And I think even most of their fans, I, I, I would imagine, would have given what, what happened last season, how bad they were. They were basically lucky to stay up on the basis of Reading's six-point deduction. Hmm. And, um, yeah, more upheaval. Unknown manager comes in. Um, I mean... If he, if this guy is kind of the sort, the sort who's who gets a bit combustible and falls out with with chairman, then um, uh, the Cardiff guy, uh, what's his name, Tan, uh, yeah. fall, falling out with him will uh, will obviously end well. Um, so yeah, I mean there could be could be some fun down down the line with that one, but yeah, I mean they're they're clearly clearly a decent side. They've they've put a lot of good um, good results together. Um, it's it's one. I don't. I don't really know whether they're pl- what sort of style they're playing. Are they playing? Are they playing quite open? Are they play? Are they basically just sitting deep and compact and picking teams off on the break? Difficult to really tell with when you look down their squad. There's nothing. Aaron Ramsey is the name that stands out, but as as you say, he's not played since September, and and yet it's it's kind of that that period of games where they've picked up the bulk of their results. So mm. yeah, dif- difficult to know what to read into into Saturday and ultimately we've just got to kind of concentrate on on our own game really. They've if got a lad watch- up front uh, called E.K. Ogbo who's a Canadian international and I'm pretty sure that he was on some kind of shortlist for Saints uh, for a striking option uh, not last summer the summer before. Uh, he's, 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 got, <laughs> he's got a couple of goals yeah um, but <laughs> I'm not sure how his progress has been in the last couple of years. If you're watching live by the way do stick your uh, your score predictions uh, in the comments. Who wants to go first with a prediction for this one? Me. 3-1. Yeah. There we go. We'll get the three one in. Uh Alfie, were you second? You're not gonna say three yeah. one as well, are you? No, I'm not this case. I'll go two one again because one of them has to be two one. <laughs> Just the laws of average and the way it's going at the moment. Uh Steve. Oh god, we finally we've got to have a clean sheet at home at some point, surely. You think? Um, not necessarily, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know. But... We thought that at the weekend. Oh god. <laughs> um yeah, nervy. Go on, one go nil. for it. Nervy yeah. one nil. A nervy one nil, right? Okay. Um, a couple of other bits just want to touch on before we finish. Um, the women's team. Um, great to see that record attendance set um, during the week thirteen thousand four hundred. I think at St Mary's for the game against mm-hmm. Arsenal in the the Continental Cup. Um, Saints taking the lead after fifty five minutes. Glenn, you managed to battle the traffic and and get there. What what did you make <laughs> of the game? You, uh, you quite enjoyed it, didn't you? Good atmosphere. I did. It was a it was a really good atmosphere. It's a really good game. It's the first uh, women's game that I've, I've ever seen live. So um, yeah, I don't really know don't really know what I expected. But it, it was a it was a really good game. It, it was a it was a really good sort of like tactical battle as well. Um, Saints basically play three at the back with wing backs, and it worked really well in the first half to sort of like stifle Arsenal. Um, our sort of three centre backs. Um, Parnell, Peak, and Mott, they they defended as if their lives depended on it from the first whistle. They were brilliant, I thought. Just just excellent. Real good commitment to defending, throwing themselves in front of the ball and, and all sorts of stuff. That was great. Um, I felt a bit sorry for our forward players because they were uh, we, we couldn't really build up through midfield terribly well. So we kept either losing the ball or hitting it long so that the forwards were... On a hide into nothing, really. Um, felt a bit sorry for them. Um, so half time, ten minutes after half time, we actually played, you know, played some decent stuff through the middle and scored the goal, which was a, a really good goal. Mm-hmm. If you had not seen it, you should check it out uh, from Molly Pike. Really, really good touch and finish. Uh, but I think it just annoyed Arsenal, and they um, they equalised like straight away. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit. They they equalised within a couple of minutes, um, and. Uh, as the game wore on, it got to about 70 minutes and Arsenal started throwing on some of their big hitters like um, uh, uh, Vivian Miedemar came on, who's like, before she got injured, was one of sort of like the world's top players. So she came on and Arsenal started to dominate a little bit and our, our three at the back sort of became a, you know, we've all seen it before, it, it became a back five and we couldn't get the ball and, and eventually the the sort of pressure told at the end. Um, but the they have taken something from the men's game. They announced the player of the match whilst the game is going on and we're defending yeah. for our lives. And um, and they, they give it to the goal scorer when they 
to, to be honest, they should have given it to one of the defenders, I think. But uh, but no, it was, um, it was a really enjoyable game, really good atmosphere. And yeah, 13,000 people. It's um, And, and as, a, as a marker of where the Saints women's team is in relation to, you know, the, the Super League clubs, I think they showed that they could certainly um, do a job in that division should should they get promoted. Uh, it was interesting to hear the Arsenal manager after mm. the game sort of like saying that he uh, he thought the Super League should be 16 clubs instead of 12, which would obviously, you know, mm. it's probably too early for that to happen next season. But, you know, hopefully there is a move towards that and um, and more clubs can uh, can benefit from that. But, uh, but no, very enjoyable. And uh, yeah, I'd certainly um, recommend anyone to get down and uh, and go and watch them. It's something we've spoken about before, isn't it, Steve? And, and as Glenn said, the Arsenal manager saying there was a case there for expanding the, the WSL and, and very complimentary about the Saints team and the setup and the, the direction of travel that it, it's all going in. Yeah, I mean, what you, the problem you have, uh, I mean, we've, we've identified this before, uh, at basically every level of women's football is that every league is really imbalanced. Mm-hmm. You've got a handful of teams at the top who whose budgets quite frankly are are a lot bigger than the teams at the bottom and that's reflected in the in the way the results go um there's a huge huge kind of gap between between the top teams and the bottom teams and you're seeing it in the women's super league is that basically the the big clubs who are the big clubs in real in in the men's game um in kind of the sort of where all the money is gone those are the big clubs in the women's game as well, because they're the ones that are putting the money in because they see the the commercial returns and 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 the like. And yeah, it's it's basically developing kind of another closed shop, which is slightly annoying. But at the end of the day, who's who who's got the power to kind of stop these sort of things? There's I mean, you're not gonna get an a, a sort of American style system with a draft and and the weaker teams getting getting the the first pick of of good players and things like that. So yeah, it's the only way you're going to be able to kind of balance things out is to get better commercial deals for the league as a whole. Um, Maybe even up the league, even up the top division by bringing in more teams who will be able to keep uh, compete in that sort of, that sort of middle tier. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I mean, looking at the championship at the moment, you look at the top four um, Saints, Charlton, uh, Palace and Sunderland. Um, the budgets, I think, for their women's teams are are pretty good. Um, certainly comparable with some of some of the lower yeah, uh, Super League in. sides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you, but you look at the sort of money that Bristol City um, yeah. and Brighton, for, Brighton slightly lesser extent, but Bristol City certainly the the sort of budget that they've got in the Super League. Um, you kind of think they're kind of doomed before they start, really. Um, so and with only one team going up and down it's it's just all a little bit a little bit stagnant um and you kind of worry what what will happen in the championship when there's three or four three or four clubs who can't get promoted every year um the motivation from people who are kind of in charge of of women's programs whether it's the team managers or people sort of above at director level and stuff lose a bit of heart and think, well, why, why are we investing in this? Um, when we, when it's more or less impossible for us to, to progress and make things better and bigger. Just the Steve, one you might in. be more well-versed than me, but there's a commercial deal in the works right now, isn't there? That's a joint yes. commercial venture between the WSL and the championship. Uh, yep. with, I think uh, championship teams receiving at least 25% of the combined revenue. It may come too late for Saints. They may be in the Super League by the time that comes in. But I mean, do you know more about that? Um, all I, all I remember, I remember reading briefly about that during the week that mm. basically all of the championship sides had initially rejected it. Mm. Um, and that it was basically all going to peter out and they'd have to come up, come up with something else and get back to the drawing board. But then kind of late during the week, there was a bit of an about turn and may, maybe there was something else sort of thrown into the offering because 25% for the division below, I mean, while it's obviously, um, a better ratio compared to the men's game from yeah. Premier League to Championship. Um, you're still kind of setting in stone that huge yeah. gulf in mm. in budgets, and I think you need to. I think they they need to find find a way to to make it a little bit more even. Well, it's good that the conversations are happening, and, and Alfie, I mean, the club must be delighted with that. 
record attendance that was I, I know they'd gone for it before and it hadn't quite worked out mm. so to actually see that many people turn up and and actually watch a good game of football it, it, it was the ideal night for them yeah you'd like to think that should Saints have some really big games in the season you know like taking on um, Sunderland or Crystal Palace or anybody that they're going to get huge crowds as well and I think from a commercial point of view I think it was a really successful night as well for the club I think in terms of you know the media that they got there it was, they, it, was it was put on like a, a you know a championship game it was put on like a full men's fixture so they had a sort of a, a trial of doing that and I think everything went really well so yeah from the club side they'll be really happy with that it's about and I think we've said it a number of times when it comes to England competitions and international tournaments it's about now just keeping that going keeping capitalizing on that but look it's growing isn't it constantly so yeah mm -hmm. good news for them Really good to see. Um, final thing this week, I just want to say thanks for all the feedback regarding our recent interview with Klaus Lundetvarm that we did. We spent an hour covering everything from both his goals that he scored for Saints, uh, the FA Cup final, that challenge on Thierry Henry, the, the testimonial that he had. Um, and also, he's really honest about some of the struggles that he faced after retiring from the game. Uh, we also managed to go through a number of your questions too. So he was talking to us about VAR and the current Saints team. Um, he's obviously been promoting his new business, which is bornsupporter.com. Um, he's been doing a lot of press, Glenn. I'm sure you've seen some stuff on the telly and, and social media as well. But happy memories of, of Klaus in, in red and white a proper proper legend oh yeah yeah i mean i remember him looking like a fish up a tree in his first game <laughs> i think it was Graham, i think it was graham soonest that bought it him was in. graham soonest yeah. yeah yeah and and he you know he was he was trying to dribble out of defense and all this sort of stuff and you could see soonest on the side going absolutely mental and and all this sort of stuff and uh but he you know he he turned into a great player for us um you know and, and he's he's up there with one of our um you know, as as one of our uh, better players, um, one that most people will will remember, and and he had some sort of like good partnerships down the years with the likes of, off the top of my head, Dean Richards, Michael Svensson, um, and you know he had a he had a, an excellent and and long career. I mean, it's it's going back to when he first signed. I mean, he signed from I think it was Bran in the Norwegian division, and he to so you you can't imagine that. Now, really, someone coming straight from the Norwegian division straight into centre back for a team that's struggling down near the bottom of the Premier League. Um, so, um, Vegard Foran says hello. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, he 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 came, he came in and he and he, um, he he did very well. Had a had an excellent career for, with us and stuck around after we got relegated as well. I know his his powers were probably on the wane by then. He was. Uh, he was struggling a bit with injuries and whatnot, but uh, no, uh, an excellent stalwart for us over the years. And uh, but I, I mean, I do remember the the cup final when he was <laughs> just, when he hang, hanging on to Thierry Henry, and we were all in the crowd going, <laughs> "Let go of him, please, let go of him." <laughs> and fair play to Thierry Henry for staying up because ninety nine percent of players would have just hit the deck, and the, we'd have been one 0 down and a player down in the first minute. Of um, of a cup final against Arsenal's Invincibles, so well, that that wouldn't have been pretty, but uh, but no, a great a great player for us over the years, and uh, yeah, good luck to him with whatever he does. I thought it was also nice that Henri gave him that shirt. He's like, if you want it, you can have it, and he gave it to him. After <laughs> oh, did the game, which I thought was quite nice. Yeah, um, Alfie, I know he did a, an interview with the Echo as well, um, and he he's just been really honest about those struggles yeah. that he had after the game, and and he 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 doesn't want anybody else to go through that. And, and, and that's, that's equally as important as kind of reminiscing about his, his glory days, the, the struggles that he had with his, his mental health post playing. Yeah. Real issues, you know, with, with depression, drugs, alcohol. And I think, um, you know, he's been like really honest about that. And we actually spoke to him about a year ago when Benji was still working for the Echo. And uh, that was when I first sort of heard about his story. And I think he, he got help um, from, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the charity that Tony Adams set up, which is... Yeah, oh, um, Sporting Chance. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, players, you know, performance sports people just to to go into, I guess, a rehab kind of thing, addiction. Um, so yeah, fair play to him for, for always talking about it. And it seems like he's in a, on a real positive path now, doesn't it? So it's good to see. Yeah, some good games as well, Steve, over the years with, with Klaus at the back. Uh, I know he was talking about his, his testimonial as well. I don't know if you remember that one against Celtic at, at St Mary's. Um, yeah, I think I missed that one. I think I was on holiday. Um, yeah, it was really bad timing, but I remember um, seeing um, sort of clips of it afterwards. And obviously Celtic, Celtic filled the end because Gordon Strachan was at Celtic at the time, yes. wasn't he? Yeah, bringing um, the team back, yeah. And yeah, I mean, he was he was brilliant. He was great for us for for a prolonged period through some teams that were terrible, some teams that were pretty good. 
Um, and I think a player who kind of spans both kind of ends of the spectrum, I think, is always one that's that's going to be remem- remembered fondly. Well, if you want to catch the, the full interview, it's still available on our YouTube channel, so you can go and watch that one. Klaus has recently, as I mentioned, launched bornsupporter.com, which is his new business venture. He was chatting to us a bit about that. It's this uh, unique poster print. It's a, a present for any newborn children, and we had a poster to give away via our socials. So thank you to everybody who watched and got involved in that. Uh, the winner is Mike Cavs. That's at SFC Mike Cavs on X. Uh, Mike's in Salisbury, so well done, Mike. Uh, Going to be in touch soon, and we'll sort that prize out for you so thank you for entering Uh, on that note that's pretty much it for this week's episode don't forget you can follow total saints podcast on facebook and x it's at total saints pod we're also on instagram and threads over there we are at total saints podcast and if you're watching the podcast on sunday night you know that we live stream tsp every week to facebook twitter x twitch and youtube and we do love hearing from you throughout the week too so you can always drop us a dm on any of those socials or you can email us via the website if you've got something to share maybe a question for the team Uh, we're also on patreon that's where you can support the podcast with a monthly contribution just visit patreon.com forward slash total saints podcast there are four different tiers on there ranging from five pounds to 20 pounds per month and each of the tiers comes with its different perks including some weekly shouts at the end of the pod for those patrons in our francis benali and our Mick Shannon tears. So thank you to Dave Melton, Mark Atkins, Andy Hollis, Anthony Thompson, Saints in Exile, Gavin Ford, James Harron, Nikki Nicholson, Southampton NY, and Drew Dyer in the Francis Benali tier. And also to Colt Baker, Dave Ernsberger, Ed Busy, Nick Higston, Phil Cook, Matt Rose, Nick Reed, Paul Stewart, Phil Horstrup, and Matt Hall in our Mick Shannon tier. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Alfie. Thank you for watching and listening. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>